Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soups. Time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please re interview the program. I'm your host, William Lou. It's a glorious Friday in Toronto. Um, joined by producer, co-host, Amamon. How you doing, man? Good, man. For one last time, Blake Murphy will be back in a couple of days on Monday. That's what I kept promising last week and uh, <laughs> didn't happen. But uh, I, I did hear from Blake. Um, he is yeah. on the men. He is feeling better. Exactly. His cat is feeling better as well. Even better. Yeah. Even better. They're just both like recouping right now. Him both on the mend. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but they'll be, uh, well, they I actually would love to see his cat in the studio. Um, well, Blake will be back on Monday, as you mentioned. But, yeah. Blake um, Murphy. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> we have not heard that drop in so long. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Well, it's because Blake didn't want to hear it all the time. Well, <laughs> I want more. Give me more. That was all. That was all. Murphy. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. That was all Blake thanks Murphy. to producer Derek, uh, who used to always hit the Blake Murphy Tuesday drop back uh, in seasons one and two. I of recall the that. Show. I recall yes. that one. Yeah. Every Blake Tuesday. Murphy Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Uh, actually, because Blake's not here, I actually felt really bad about it because we have Jose Calderon come out on the show. Jose Calderon. Okay. That's how I say it. I was not expecting that nope. on it. That's how I but, say it. Uh, yeah, Numero Ultra will be on the show. Um, obviously, a longtime Raptor. Um, I think still second in Raptors franchise history in assists. Maybe we'll look that up. I don't know if Fred got past him, but I kind of doubt it. I think Kyle's definitely number one. And um, yeah, Jose... Previously was number one, actually, as well. But the reason I kind of felt bad about it was that's actually Blake Murphy's favorite player mm -hmm. is Jose Calderon. To so the point where he actually named uh, one of his former pets. He named a dog after Jose. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote about it extensively back at Raptors Republic. So the, the dog's name the was Jose or Calderon? It was, it was Jose. Okay. Yeah. He is second all-time in assists. Yeah. There you go. So Jose is coming on. And then we're going to talk to Michael Grange at 3.30, tee up. Um, Tonight's matchup between the Raptors and the Magic, but on a more, on a much more sober note, uh, if you haven't heard the news already, I wanted to pass along a statement. This is, comes from the Barrett family uh, that was released um, last night, and it stated that it is with profound sadness and heavy hearts that we announce the loss of our beloved son and brother Nathan Tyler Barrett, who passed away on Tuesday, March twelfth, surrounded by his family, church, and friends. While our family is devastated by this great loss, we will continue to cherish the memories and time spent together. Nathan was a God-fearing young man of strong character. He was thoughtful, kind, loving, compassionate, creative, admirable, and driven. During this difficult time, our family would like to ask for privacy, but greatly appreciates the outpouring of love, support, and prayers that have we have been receiving. Through this time, although his time with us was brief, he will live forever in our hearts so that came from the Barrett family um, I know RJ has been away for the team for the last couple of days due to a personal reason it is so sad and so unfortunate that this has happened um Nathan I believe was only 19 and mm. um yeah his, his younger brother had passed um and I, I think the Raptors obviously in this case will do everything they can to support RJ and his family however much time he needs to process something like this um I'm sure he will take, and I'm sure the Raptors will give him that space. And I think that, you know, uh, or at least I really hope and I really trust that there will be some sort of way for the Raptors to uh, tribute and honor um, his family when RJ does return to the lineup eventually. But that's obviously very secondary to this really sad news. So, Yeah. Um, I mean, as a parent myself of uh, two kids, this is something that I, I don't think they'll ever get over. Right? This is something that's going to linger. It's going to hurt for a very long time. You don't get over it. You just learn to cope and move on as best you can with your life. So I, I wish them all the best. This is extremely, extremely painful. It's a, an awful experience to go through, and I wish them nothing but the best, them and the family, RJ, everyone. Um, yeah. Very, very sad. Absolutely. And, um, you know, for Rowan, too, who uh, obviously manages the uh, Team Canada program, um, you see Ron all the time at Raptors games. You see them all the time after the game. You know, everyone clears out. The arena is pretty much empty except for people kind of just picking up uh, and tending to the arena, maybe sometimes changing over to the hockey side. And you always see, like, friends and family sticking around. You always see saw Rowan and his family and, and the Barrett family just sticking around after games and stuff like that, too. So 
just want to send our best wishes to them in, in this difficult time. And um, there's no real way to pivot and transition off of this. So I'm just going to um, yeah. say that we will talk about the Raptors and talk to Jose and other things as well. But just wanted to pass that news along. And it's, again, really, really unfortunate. So the topic I wanted to talk about with the Raptors was just sort of checking up on how this sort of transition to the rebuild was going. Um, I think that, you know, we have learned a couple of things this season because of all the trades. And even though we're not being able to finish out the season by seeing everybody healthy and available to play for a variety of reasons, the Raptors have had, honestly, a lot of really unfortunate setbacks. Yeah. Right. Um, we haven't been able to see the whole group, at, you know, operating in, in tandem. Having said that, though, we have seen this team transition and pivoted off to this sort of Barrett, Barnes, and quickly core. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we have seen them play together now for about two months without Pascal Siakam uh, since that uh, trade to the Pacers. So I want to ask you, what is something new you've learned about each of BBQ um, since the Pascal trade? Let's start with Scotty for you. Scotty Barnes, um, once again, like it, maybe it's not new because... Uh, he's a when we were talking about doing the segment, um, we were kind of looking at like what kind of teams or what can they emulate in terms of a rebuild model from other teams. And I kept on getting stuck because I'm like, he is so unique. Mm -hmm. There is no player type that really fits what Scotty is. And that's what makes him so great. So I get it. it was nice seeing him be that guy that he was for a few seasons with the Toronto Raptors when they had Fred and Pascal and everyone that he can just find his spots to continue to put up uh, put up points. Now, how they integrate him and get the best out of all three of them, I think is kind of the. The tougher one because you know ideally a, a person of his size he you want him to be like your dribble handoff big but they're gonna have Jakob Pertl they have Kelly Olenek who can you know Kelly can space right. the floor but I mean what is what is Scotty Scotty's role within that he can obviously uh, you know handle the ball he can run pick and roll by himself he can be a ball handler in DHOs too but how do you get the best out of him along with getting the best out of the other two players because he's probably the most versatile of the three but um, getting that chemistry in between all three of them and getting them in sync is going to be the harder part of uh, Darko's job here. So I didn't really give you much of an answer, but I just, it's, he continues to do stuff that makes him valuable despite maybe not having as much of an on ball role. And it's impressive. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've seen Scotty play, well, it's technically 20 games, but I'm going to slash out the Warriors game because he got yeah. injured midway through and it's just going to bring everything down. Um, so he played 19 complete games. We'll say that much uh, since the Pascal Siakam trade. Scotty averaged 19.7 points, 7.7 7 rebounds, 7.2 assists, 1.1 uh, 1 .1 steals, mm. 1 1.6 blocks, shot 46% from the field, only 22% from three and 84% from the foul line. I think number one for me is like in, in the first two seasons of Scotty in Toronto, obviously it was a very different tra uh, team, but you saw that his numbers actually did improve both in volume and mm -hmm. both in efficiency when he had guys like Fred and Pascal on the floor with them. And I think that, you know, um, there were obviously ways that those two, especially as the older players, but also drew a lot of more of the attention to, at, at least in the first two seasons, um, were able to make things a little bit easier for Scotty. And, you know, when he was on the floor without some of the main creators, that's when you actually saw like a dip yeah. this year, especially in these 20 games, even without those guys, obviously they've, they've since been gone. Um, Fred moved on to free agency, Pascal got traded you saw that Scotty was able to maintain his level and continue to go forward. I think the only thing is just the three-point shooting came down, which, you know, at the start of the season was really hot, and the middle of the season uh, the he pulled off. shots got harder, that's for sure. Shots got harder. I think Scotty reports got a little bit harder as well. But ultimately, the general production of his game was still pretty strong. And, of course, there yeah. were still some ups and downs for sure. I think that it's a bit head-scratching what happened at the end of that OKC game in the overtime periods where he didn't really want to be involved or even in that Spurs game. Um, but ultimately, you've also seen a strong rebound from that. And I really liked his mm -hmm. focus and, and intensity post-All-Star break. And I really felt like he was taking ownership and leadership over the team um, in a way that I've, made me feel very confident. So I'm hoping that that just continues after he's able to return, whether that's this season or next season. Yeah. What about uh, quickly? Quickly played 18 games now without or since the Pascal trade. He has averaged 19.2 points, 4.7 rebounds, 6.9 assists, uh, 0 0.9 steals, shooting 43% from the field, 39% from three, uh, getting to the foul line, uh, only 3.3 times per game, which is a little bit low, but it's mm. trending upwards recently, and he's launching about eight threes a game. Good. What is something new that you've learned about quickly, especially now that he's been able to run the team, even without Scotty and RJ available? 
Yeah, it's, it's pick and roll. We talked about it a little bit yesterday, too, is that this is going to be kind of the key. Like, if you look at all three of them, they're they're going to be, be advantageous for the Raptors in different ways. Like, yeah. RJ, they can all ball handle, which is awesome. But, you know, coming off pin downs and getting in the paint, that's going to be kind of RJ's thing. He's very good at it. And IQ, he needs his kind of uh, realm of, you know, possibilities of how he's going to be uh, executing on the offensive end. And I think pick and roll, getting cerebral in that kind of sense and getting chemistry with Scotty, with mm -hmm. Kelly, with uh, Jakob. We've seen him kind of get that going with Kelly um, over this last little while, but obviously the other two players aren't here right now. But him being comfortable, kind of like going into a storm where there's a lot of bodies. Sometimes he's getting blitz. Sometimes uh, there's a strong hedge. Sometimes there's a soft switch. Whatever the case is, and he's recognizing that and he's making plays out of it. That's growth. That's maturity. That's him taking strides and also probably watching film, talking to Darko, all that, all that stuff. And that's going to be where he's going to get the bulk of his points probably yeah. outside of, you know, just like chasing down threes and uh, that kind of stuff and catch and shoots. But him getting that area of his game down now, also the you know, rest of the season and going forward is going to be where he's going to be so effective for this team. And it's, it's just like a different element that they mm -hmm. really require uh, to be a good offensive team. Like a, a couple of things that come to mind with these three is that, um, in the last 15 games, right, their net rating is 6.2, right? And that's in 291 minutes. Are you now, talking about those three on the floor? Yeah. The net rating is yes. 6.2, which is pretty good considering it the is. fact that the Raptors have lost, obviously, a lot of these games. Yeah. So the fact that when they have their main three, they're actually a positive is a really strong point. Yeah. And like a big positive, right? Like some of the best lineups, if you're looking at three-man combinations, like the Denver's, um, the Clippers, things like that, they're around like nine or so, nine, eight. And so they're not that far off, obviously small sample size, but they're trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's sure. really important for them. For sure. I mean, and this is the only sample we have to go off of, right? Yep. Because until Pascal got moved off the team, like he was still the number one focus um, in scattering reports and things like that. And, and you take this new direction, this new group, see how they played. RJ played 14 games um, since Pascal was dealt, averaging 20.6 points, 5.4 rebounds, 4.5 assists, shooting 55% from the field, 47% from three, which is amazing. Holy, uh, yeah. 55% from the free throws, which is a little strange. But, mm. um, yeah, I mean. Maybe Jose can help him. Honestly, maybe. <laughs> but pointers. I think for RJ, for me, it's just he's been really, really engaged. It's not really a game I ever watch him, especially uh, as a Raptor, where he's not giving his absolute very best and trying to find a way to win. Yeah. There are things you can sort of look at in the margins, like getting better defensively, getting more consistent off the ball, catching shooting. Um you know, maybe even just creating his own shot, uh, things like that. But, mm -hmm. like, generally speaking, he's taken the right shots. He's been really efficient when he's been asked to run the offense. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think he's not, not been a pleasant surprise, but I think he's shown you a lot of that promise and potential of what he was coming out of college. And it's not like his time in New York was just purely bad. It wasn't. Yeah. But New York fans were kind of hot and cold a little bit on it. And I think for Raptor fans, we've only gotten reason to feel hot about the fact that he's been – you know, red hot from the field. Yeah, red hot, definitely. He was uh, labeled a toxic contract coming to Toronto, which is insane considering where he is now. He's shooting 45% from three yeah. over the past 15 games. And, and so, by the way, the context around that, I, I just really wanted to put that out yeah. there to be clear. It was um, it was Zach Lowe who mentioned it after that trade happened. And it wasn't Zach Lowe's opinion. It was him talking to league executives who had yeah. described it like that. Yeah. And it wasn't like RJ, by the way, it was strange because RJ's not on like, an absurdly large contract. It's pretty I, reasonable considering where the cap's going to be going. Yeah, so RJ Bear yeah. is on a roughly about 30 a year um, yeah. going forward. Yeah, it's at, it's at 24 this year, 26 next year, 28 the year after, and then 30. So even yeah, less than escalates. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like that puts you in the ballpark of, I don't know, it's less than like Jeremy Grant, for example. Sure. Or it's like less than Tyler Hero. Yeah. It's less than Jordan Poole. Exactly. Yeah. And that's totally fine by me. Yeah. Um, like with him, I mean, he's just, he comes into the system and he's exactly what a Darko Ryukovic, Rakovic um, would want from a player on the wing, right? Being able to come off pin downs, go hard to the basket, mm -hmm. being able to make decisions on the fly, kick out passes, skip passes. Um, there's some turnovers issues, sure, sometimes, but I think that's part of the system too, is you're making fast decisions. Mm. Turnovers are going to be uh, along with that. I mean, look, if you give me 20 points and shoot 55% from the field, I, I'm okay with you having 2.5 turnovers. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's absolutely fine, especially because he is find, he's yeah. finding his, his, his guys, right? He's yeah. finding them in the corners. He's making nice passes. He's uh, making quick reads on, on the fly. And I think that's what is going to be his role going forward. Like he, he has to be the person that is just suffocating and so hard to guard through pin downs and like there were cases in that denver game where they were trying to shade him right but he kept on getting to his left mm -hmm. which is 
you know, uh, Darkwood said uh, the Manu Ginobili comparison. Now he's not there exactly, but Manu was always very good at that. Like you can try to make him go right, but he'll find ways to get to his left hand to get to where he wants to go on the court. And uh, it's been like the instincts, the the ability to just make fast reads on the fly in traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been pretty. Uh, it's been pretty good for the Raptors. And defensively, we'll have to see like where they want to go with his role on, on that side of things. We'll get to it in a second, I guess. But um, you know, is he going to be an on ball? Uh, suffocator, uh, on-ball stopper? Is he going to be reliable on like back cuts and stuff like that? Because he has had some issues with that with the Raptors, along with a lot of the players. They're going to have to figure that out. But overall, I mean, he's been a huge positive, and it's a, it's a bright future to me for RJ. Yeah, um, on the subject of defense, so we had this discussion yesterday yeah. um, because we, we know that these three will have Jacoperto joining them in the starting group. Um, so it's really just a question mark as to who the fifth starter will be. And, and the Raptors have been really struggling defensively. I mean, I put the stats out there already, but since it's number first, the Raptors are 29th in defensive rating. Mm. And that's through various iterations. Like OG was still a t- member of the team in yeah. December, right? And then Pascal was still a member of the team in January. And then, you know, we've had injuries obviously since. It's not like since the injuries they're like this. Like, no, no, they've just been consistently like second worst in the league yeah. for the majority of the season. But in any case, who is that fifth starter that should be playing with this group. And uh, I have some questions for you otherwise, but just like, what's the general type of player that should be the fifth, you know what I mean? Starter yeah, with this has group. been like a, a topic for us kind of over the past few weeks. And it's it's a hard thing to figure out because you have Scotty, you have uh, RJ, decent three-point shooters. Like mm-hmm. you, you don't really know where they're going to head out, right? Like I mentioned the numbers with RJ, but uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be, you know, the case going forward. Scotty was having some issues in the latter part of the season. Um, but you have IQ, right? He's a high volume, good three point shooter. If you have Scotty and RJ just constantly putting pressure on the rim, you kind of do need like a knockdown shooter. And we're, I'm talking about Gary Trent Jr. That 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 five some of them has been pretty good. Mm-hmm. And okay. uh, but at the same time, now they're also using Gary as their screen navigator, their perimeter guard, um, who has to get through screens and fight through some pretty uh, aggressive play by you know some pretty notable point guards, and also you know it's making like. The, he's kind of like the first line of defense. And if mm-hmm. that breaks down, like your whole defense breaks down. Um, and he's had some ups and downs with that. He's trying. I see that there's a, there's a commitment there. Uh, but is that the answer for you? Now, if it's not, then, okay, so IQ's doing that. Now he's used to that. But now everyone else kind of gets shifted in a different area. And Scotty and RJ, they're going to be your wing stoppers. But then you need that extra person. And mm-hmm. it probably has to be someone with a bit more size. Right, probably. and I, I think yeah. that would be probably their their best well, route. And how are you going to acquire that player? I don't think they have that person in house. That's the interesting thing because when you talk about roles, like they typically and Darko is typically not put quickly on the tough opposing point guard. He hasn't yet. So what you're and then what we saw Scotty settle into was those big tough wings. He will take those, mm-hmm. but then those tougher guard point guard assignments. Gary was taking those. So it depends. You want a guy with size, but the bigger you put him, and then all of a sudden it's more difficult for them to like navigate yeah. screens. So it, it does become a question of, do you want another guard who can really get around screens and also play some good defense and, and knock down some shots? Like a 3 and D guard? Or do you want more of like a 6-9 type of forward? Like, an, yeah. you know, who can really cover just in general and play a lot of help defense? To me, I think it's probably a little bit more important to get a guard yeah. Just so to stop those opposing guard matchups. And, th- and that's where it's going to be interesting. The Raptors do have a number of um, in-house uh, c- contributors. I think two candidates for this. And, and my question for them is just, can they be positive contributors next season? And uh, I had Grady Dick and Ochai Abaji on this list. Yeah. So um, I think we reasonably have confidence in Grady, especially seeing the second half of the season. But I think it's a question of how positive. Like, is it in so positive? Of your, can, your he, confidence can he start for you? Can he start? So he's going to be this person that we're talking about, the next sure. person. Oh, and that's, see, I, I don't like putting him in that position to be that player. Um, I don't think he's there yet. Like, okay. he's been having some issues, like, over the past few games. Like, after that Portland game, teams are guarding him differently, right? Mm-hmm. They're getting a lot, he's getting a lot more pressure. His, uh, his decision-making has to be that much faster, and he's being challenged. And now you want him to do that along with uh, being, you know, relied upon to play some solid defense against, you know, first units, not second units. Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure, but also you want to have a decent uh, bench unit too. And his uh, scoring, his ability to shoot the ball, um, his chemistry you can form with like a, a Kelly Olynyk, um, whatever the case is, he's a, he could be a, a, a lineup uh, razor, mm. right, for that bench unit. And I like that idea. And you can decide, okay. you know, going down stretch of a game if he's if he's hot, if he's feeling it, if you're having some shooting issues, and he's your guy right now, then roll with it. But um, putting him in that position, I, I don't know. And then we got 
Ochai, and uh, I kind of said my piece about him yesterday, and, I, and after reflecting on it, I thought maybe I was a bit hard on him. I felt okay, that maybe, uh, well, because like he's playing lineups right now that aren't going to be lineups going forward, right? Like if he's okay. playing with better players, if he has Jakob Pertl and Kelly Olenek as the bigs and he's cutting off of them and uh, he's he's uh, going out with the uh, players that are going to make clear cuts and they're going to roll properly, they're going to cut at the right time, then it's going to complement him too. Like, yes, mm -hmm. like he's going to be a three and D, sh take your shots, finish in transition, that kind of player. Um, and defensively, is he ready to be that stopper that we're talking about? That's... What I'm not really sure about, uh, I, I would do wonder that, you know, if he gets into an uh, off-season program with Darko and they settle in on something that they mm -hmm. want him to truly get better at, like that's an opportunity for him to kind of take this role because they need it, right? Yeah, and uh, that, that yeah. is an expensive role to try and fill if they're trying to win games next season and they need this, right? It's not, there's no doubt right. about that. Yeah, I think Ochai, best case scenario, I think he can maybe slide into that as a fifth slot. He can guard guards, which is really nice. Yeah. He can be that point of um, attack defender for you. But offensively, there there is a clear gap between him and Grady, and there's a clear gap between a guy like Gary and and he, Gary's on this list of are they still here next season? Yeah. Right. So man. Gary Trent Jr. unrestricted free agent, Bruce Brown, uh, team option, right? And also there's obviously a lot of discussion about potentially moving him on. Jordan Wara, unrestricted free agent, Jonte Porter. You know, you, you have his rights, so you can choose to control. Mm -hmm. And then I put on Javon just for you, man. I, I know that's your guy. <laughs> I'm just gonna assume he's already here, but. Those those first three, Gary, yeah. Bruce, and Jordan, which of them are still here for how much and why? I I wouldn't be surprised if none of them are here. Okay. Okay. Um, starting with Bruce, uh, like, look, they need a backup point guard. Mm -hmm. They need someone. He's been in that role. And from the signs that I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen, it seems like he wants more of an on-ball role. He wants to get his shots up. That's what I've been seeing. Right now, this isn't the same role that he had with the Denver Nuggets. And I think that he wants to deviate to something else where it allows him to get his game off a little bit. And I don't know if he is the person. If you're going to have a backup point guard doing that, I don't know if he's a guy for that. Now, if he's going to be settling into a different kind of role, then maybe it makes sense. But also, as you know, Bobby has mentioned too, that's a pretty interesting contract. You can do a lot with something like that. And I'm sure there's going to be a market for him. So that's something they got to consider. And I Personally, Do you think th his play with the Raptors has changed the market for him? I don't think so. Really? Because he's already shown that what he can do on a championship team. But he did that with Jokic. Yeah. yeah. And we all know that Jokic puts, he raises the tide of all players. I think more so is about the defensive end. Um, and he like he was on that back line of like when the pick and rolls happening with the sorted teams like he was the guy that was making like strong rotations him and KCP he was very good at it he was the guy that was no, I'm not saying that the, he, yeah, yeah. he doesn't bring value but yeah. I think for a lot of teams when they're acquiring former Denver players yeah how many players have left Denver and people are like ooh they're even better or ooh yeah. they're the, exactly the same as what we got before and how many of them are like Will Barton yeah. I mean, he's a little younger, too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and there's that. And uh, I think there's still the elements of his game that are uh, intriguing. Like, there's some shooting. Obviously, there's the cutting game. And uh, if the he's cutting, able I think, to, is the best thing he could do. Like, and, almost function well, as a small big man. Oh, but he's yeah. got to finish his layups, man. It's well, like that, That's going to happen. That's going to happen. It's actually interesting because, you know, I feel like when you said it was like, all right, he's taking, he wants to get his game off. I'm like, you know, it, it does feel that way when I watch. But then when his usage, when you look at his usage, Mm -hmm. It's at 15.7 with the Raptors. It's actually a little bit lower than Indiana with 16.7. And then last year with Denver, he was at 17.8. But 15.7 is actually directly in line with his career average. But I, I do get that sense where he's he's taking these gambles and he's making these sort of aggressive pushes. And I think that that's ultimately where it's sort of um, coming up a little bit short for him. But I, I, to me, it's just a question of can the Raptors get what they want out of this situation, right? Can they yeah. get a first-round pick? Can they get a prospect? And if they can do that and they can get Bruce into a more competitive situation, I think it's a kind of a win-win for, for everybody. Bruce? What? What would you want for Bruce in return? Um, like what's the ideal? Because I've, I've wrestled with the idea of maybe you're able to find some sort of 3 and D kind of player. I that think can, I'd take uh, a pick. But would, or, would you take an Ocha Abadji level prospect for him? I would, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think I would too. Yeah, maybe a little taller, but yeah. <laughs> so is Gary here next season, you think? It's hard. Like they have a lot of cap space, and mm -hmm. but they have to consider they have that uh, they're gonna, yeah, and they got they got to resign uh, IQ soon. They got to resign Scotty soon. So you got to well, think they extend about Scotty. Yeah. yeah, but the money's it's gonna get much more expensive. But soon. it won't kick in for next year. True, yeah. true, true. But if you're gonna sign him to like a long term deal, mm -hmm. right? That's something they got to consider their future but I mean, money. I, do you feel like Gary's a guy that maybe you put inside the money? Like, do, is Gary a guy that you want to put like a two three year contract under, or is or like a maybe three or four year contract? I, I think that to me. 
Yeah. It's kind of like See, he's trying not. to prove that he is a starting caliber shooting guard. And that the will reason require why, him to yeah. really guard and yeah, continue to yeah. you know, be efficient with his offense. He's done good with his offense. He's, as the years yeah. gone on, he's getting better and better in offense and finding the level that we know him to be. But defensively, or the second skill has always been the missing part. Yeah, and uh, he's got to find out what he's capable of, I think. Like, it's either he's going to be your sixth man kind of thing, or he's going to be this person that Darko is letting him audition to be. Right. And uh, I, has he shown enough to warrant, you know, the extension that he probably does want uh, with the Toronto Raptors? I, I don't know about that, but there's still time, too. He, like, he's questionable tonight. He might come back, and maybe we can see a better, more of a sample size of what he's going to be bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's still TBD. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I'm not saying no. Um, I'm just saying that we still have to figure out where uh, Gary's going to be at the end hasn't, of the season. I feel like hasn't he been roughly the same player for the last three years with the Raptors? He has been offensively, yes. Yes, he has. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this role that he's being put in, yeah. it's on purpose because they want to see if he can do it. And that's where they want him to be. They could, they could, they could make uh, the decision that IQ is going to be this person. Yeah. They could do that, but they're not. Why are they doing that? Because they're letting him like show me. It's a I show me moment. If he's willing to do two more years at similar rate to what he's currently making, for me, yeah. I'm I'm happy to keep Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and uh, I mean he's a great locker room person. It seems like he's a he's a good dude. Uh, everyone that I've encountered, probably you've talked to him a lot of times too, mm -hmm. that uh, they like him, and he's a good locker room person, which is obviously very important. Team chemistry. Um, I saw the other day that uh, they were letting one of the team equipment managers, I believe, they were letting her, they were bringing her up to dunk. On I saw it on the Raptors IG page. And mm -hmm. he was like featured in that. He's always smiling. The fits are awesome. Um, this is all chemistry. It all contributes to it. And uh, I wouldn't be mad if they re-signed him. But it's just like the, the stuff that we're talking about defensively is where I'm kind of, eh, is he, is this the move you want to go? You know? Well, look, if you can find an upgrade, by all means, go ahead. But otherwise, I, I see no reason that... Yeah. We need to necessarily move on. Um, I know some people are just not a fan of his style. That's fine. Yeah. People have preferences and, uh, you know, you can adjust based on it. But again, I, I would like to see the Raptors not just lose players for nothing. Sure. Um, I think the last question I had was just, how are you feeling about Darko in general? I think because you see the offensive execution with him. It's been very consistent of what he wanted to do when he came to Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. Moved the ball a lot. Fourth in passes per game. The Raptors are this season. Yeah. That's up from last year. Their third in assists per game, which is definitely up from last year. Mm -hmm. um, the Raptors, as Darko described the start of the year, they have a lot of their bigs handling the ball and directing traffic. You've seen that with all three of their centers, right? You've seen that with uh, Jakob, with Kelly, who they brought in, and then Jante, who they brought in. All three of those guys yeah. do that to a, a large degree. You see a lot of cuts. You see very few isolations. I know. remember one thing where we were interviewing Chris Boucher the start of the season, and he said Darko had this drill for them in training camp where you weren't allowed to dribble. Mm. Whole time, all you can do is cut and move and pass. And that was to sort of to teach them, to sort of like get them out of some of the bad habits, but also get them to understand how much easier the game can be yeah. if you do it like that. It's and very European. Very, very. But, you know, like it. the Raptors have fallen through. They're third last in yep. terms of uh, isolations per game. They rarely isolate. And in terms of cuts, they score the seventh most in the NBA off of cuts as well. So I think you're seeing Darko's offensive plan in action. My question now is, what is his defensive plan? Question. When you were looking up that seventh in cuts, did mm -hmm. you also see what they were in points per possession? Because I think they're like I'll kind of in the middle 20th area, which is like if you're going to be cutting this much, you probably want more points out of it, which is something that they also have to address. But yeah, defensively. I mean, how do you address having more points off cuts though? Huh? Finishing at the rim. <laughs> well, okay. All right. I mean... Essentially, like... I, I guess. Finishing better at the rim. Yeah, that's kind of kind of it. But, I mean, they all go hand in hand together. Yeah. Um, having yeah. better offensive flow, having, like, you know, better... They're fine. They're, like, 1.33 points per okay. possession on cuts. Okay. I, think, right. I think it's just really just a question of, like, yeah. how much... How many cuts can you get yeah. in a game? Sure. Right? Because that's a very efficient play, technically. But, in any case, I do agree with you, though. They, yeah. they can finish a little bit stronger, but it's, like, right in line with league average. And they're mm. typically finishing with guards rather than, like... I don't know. Like, I feel like the Nuggets should be number one. <laughs> like, it's Aaron Gordon just catching lobs man, um, from Jokic. But, yeah, defensively, what is the... I, yeah. I, I get Darko's offensive vision. I largely agree with it. I like it. I think, we, you know, we can even say it's aesthetically better than sure. what it was last year. I think that's undeniable, 100%. too. What is the defensive vision? Side note, well done getting that quote from Garrett Temple yesterday on how the Raptors have uh, oh, adjusted thanks. their defense yeah. before they were funneling. Now they're weaking, stronging, which is essentially your forcing guys towards the baseline on their off or strong hand um, because they don't have the rim protector anymore, right? Yakov yeah. isn't there, so very different. But anyways, 
Good job on that. Good Thank quote. you. I mean, it was Garrett's. It was Garrett's. Uh, yeah. This is something Garrett chose to reveal, not not me. Sure. I, I was thinking about just how can they improve defensively. And I'm still thinking about that question. <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I mean, I, I think we got to see them healthy, uh-huh. definitely. Um, I think uh, concepts-wise, he has shown some ability to make adjustments on the fly. Now, something else we have to consider, too, is do you have the personnel to make those adjustments on the fly? Mm. That's something you got to think about, too. Side note again, um, I was listening to J.D. Reddick's podcast, and he said the only time in his entire career he's ever been uh, blitzed off a DHO was in 2019 against the Toronto Raptors. Mm-hmm. And he said that their rotations on the back line were insane. That mm-hmm. was like an incredible defensive team. But you can do stuff like that when you have the personnel for it. But if you don't have the guys that are in sync with the game plan and can make these like live reads that are very mm-hmm. hard to do, yep. it's hard to make these adjustments on the fly that maybe he's thinking he wants to do, but he's like, yeah, but then maybe like, you know, this guy's not going to be here. It's going to be open layup. And now like, where are we going to, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. So that is something that we have to consider. Um, personnel wise, I think they have the guys to be a strong defensive team. I mean, they have the rim protector. Um, I've thought about, you know, it, without Yaka Pertle, like how does this defense look going forward? Because I mean, I'm just like going through a bunch of possibilities with this team mm-hmm. and uh, they still need that guy. And it's no different than we were, where we were a couple of years ago when they got Yaka Pertle, that they need a rim protector. Every team needs someone. Mm-hmm. You want some versatility with your defense and how you're able to guard teams. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, uh, you need that guy. So Yaka Pertle is there. I think once they're able to get back to funneling towards him, that's a very good thing for this defense. And then you have RJ, you mm-hmm. have Scotty Barnes. Um, I think that's very good. But my question there guys, is, yeah. again, we've had Yaka for most of the season, and the Raptors, again, since December 1st. Yeah. December 1st, uh, they are 29th in defense. Yeah. So that alone is not changing it. I hear you. Um, I, I want to give him some grace because that's when kind of the three different versions of this team started. And I think that's been that's heavily influenced the productivity of their defense. That's my opinion. Okay, on it. All okay. Right. I think all right. I don't want to like you know, give them a scape, scapegoat, but yeah. I, we've seen them raise their level at different times defensively. Okay, okay. Um, we've seen it against the Denver Nuggets. We saw it against Portland at times. Getting it them to do it, you know, yeah, possession every, by possession. Realistically, yeah. Alma, everybody yeah, yeah. has possession stretches or, or even quarters halves where they play good defense. Yeah, but consistency is the consistency, and I think that's where to me it's like. What 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 is showing? What is it with the Raptors where it's like if you if you don't do this for me defensively, you're not going to get minutes. You know what I mean? Like where where is that line? Well, I, mean, I haven't seen that line all know, season. And that's that is a problem that I have. Um, yeah. I was going to get to that too. Is okay. that uh, right. it, sorry? Not no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's please, like please, it's the accountability aspect. I think is really important. Now, I don't think players are being held accountable right now, um, and by design because so many injuries. This isn't the version of the team we're going to no, see I'm next season. I'm not asking for yeah, this specific team yeah, yeah, who is yeah. probably going to play Jamias Ramsey tonight. Sure, sure. Like, is but that, you, can you, know. eat, you can hold players accountable easier when you have better players coming off your bench, right? Like, okay, you can say, right, okay, like, right. if RJ is, uh, he's missed a few rotations, and he's done that before. With Gary Trent Jr., I've seen it. Mm-hmm. He's done it with RJ, but that's when they were healthy, yeah. right? They bring in another guy. He has a, a conversation. Gary even cited that he's done that already with him. Um, it was in the second half of a game when Gary was healthy, obviously. But anyways, he took him out for like three or four possessions and he went back in. So he wants to do this, but you just have to have the people for it. Um, it it's, I, I hear it's, you. It's a, a cop-out answer and I apologize, no, but I just I can't judge Fine, him defensively right now based off what I see at this very second. Like yeah. they're they're going against like the Orlando Magic tonight and but, but how I'm many not players do they have? Judge off yeah. this game, Almond. I'm asking for yeah. the whole season because even at the start of the year, right? Yeah. When we when we when we saw the starting lineup. Sure. Um Oh, gee, one of the best defenders in the league, yes or no? Yeah. Jakob Proto, you mentioned how important it is mm. as a rim protector. He's a really good defender, right? Yep. Pascal, at least average, if not above average. Better be for the Pacers, but yeah. Okay, whatever. Let's. Pascal <laughs> yeah. might be the weakest of the five. Yeah. Uh, Scotty, is he a really good help defender? Yes. And, and then uh, Dennis, is he a pretty good on-ball defender? He should be, yes. Okay. Yeah. With that starting five for the most of the season before OG got traded, the Raptors are still dead average in defense. Mm. Yeah. yeah. 15th. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's true. Um, so yeah. I, that, that to me is like, yeah. and, and listen, that group might just not work together defensively because, you know, for example, last year with the Raptors under a different coach and Nick Nurse, they also didn't guard at a high level either. Mm-hmm. But I also thought there were other issues alongside of that. And they only got Jakob for the last third of the season. Yeah. When they did get Jakob in, their defense was actually pretty good. My point is, though, even when they had better personnel, I didn't see that defensive execution and like intensity or yeah. consistency. And and that's to me is like, yeah. unless we get to that point, we're going to have a similar season again. 
When did it uh, kind of fall off the rails? I was just doing some quick uh, number crunching here. So mm-hmm. from uh, October, beginning of the season mm-hmm. to, you know, mid-November, right? They were in the seven range. They were good. They right? were good at the very, like, yeah. three weeks of the season. They were good. So refresh my memory if you can. Like, what it, was there an injury that happened? No, that, I mean, the starting five was actually happen? really healthy. I yeah. mean, even OG missed some time. Yeah. Because uh, he, he cut his hand moving some furniture or whatever. But still, like, oh, ultimately, yeah. he was, av- like, the starting five was actually remarkably available. Mm. And then um, up until the, o- the OG trade, like, they had their starting group together for the most part. And, yeah. That doesn't even yeah. count for, like, having better defenders off the bench, for sure. example, like Precious. And this might get down to, like, we're, we're problem-solving on the fly here. I think um, this might go back to the adjustments part, where maybe that we're not seeing him be as innovative. And like, you and I have talked about this, too, is, like, you know, in, in certain cases, like, are you making the proper lineup changes at that moment where you just have to do it? Otherwise, you know, a team goes on, like, a 12-0 run, and, like, in a game of runs that he's also echoed before, um, if you take three, four possessions off and you're not making the right decision, like, a team's going to kill you there. And uh, I think there's that's a sound point that maybe on that side of things, he has to probably get a little bit better. But also, I think that he probably did get a little bit better over the course of the season because I think we're seeing more of that now. But now he doesn't have the people to do it. <laughs> well, I, I, the other flip side of this yeah. is I think maybe he took this year to really put in the offense. Sure. And next year he puts in that's more reliable. Everyone understands that a little bit more. And then especially with a healthier group, yeah. put in defensive. Because, again, Raptors aren't going anywhere if there are 29 29- in defense for four months of the season again. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's my only thing. Yeah. So I, I would like to see an improved amount of defense uh, from the group and also yeah. from the head coaching staff. But and in also, any case, you can also put in the greatest schemes and if your team's not executing sure. or if they're not giving the right effort or, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, but uh, and also a big question a team, for me, though. When you're a team that is building through your wings, mm. um, which they kind of are in a way with RJ and Scotty, I guess we're going to have to see like, what they do with their starting lineup going forward. Um they have to be your best defenders, right? Because they're going to be relied upon to be your wing stoppers, your help defenders in a lot of cases. So mm-hmm. it kind of starts there with this team. Okay. And uh, it's going to be on Scotty and RJ to to level up there. Um, not that they can't, but uh, that's how I kind of look yeah. at it with, um, with them, with a team like the Celtics too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's no different. Mm. All right. Well, that's where we're at uh, in this point in the season. We're going to take a quick break, and then yep. we'll come back, and uh, we're going to talk – couple topics around the NBA. So we're going to take that break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Blue. Continue with Joe. my producer co-host, Amit Mon. Amit, taking us around the NBA. What do you got, man? All right. So just to start off right here. So first off, congratulations to Shea. Um, he passed Kevin Durant in Thunder history for most 30-point games in a single season, mm. right? So now he has 48. The record was 47. Um, so awesome. Like, that's that's him. He gets 30 points a game mm-hmm. on the rec. However, the game that he did it, it was against the Pacers, and I'm going to bring up the play right here because it's been a little bit scrutinized, and it's the the concept of stat padding. Now, regardless of this game, he was going to break the record, obviously, because he's been doing 30-point games nonstop throughout the year. But in this play, um, he... The game is uh, it's a 10-point game. Obviously, the Pacers are about to win it. There's 14 seconds left. He fouls a Pacer to make them go to the free-throw line. And then afterwards, he runs the ball down the court, open lane because no one's really playing defense. Mm. He gets a layup, two points, and now he's past the record. And after that, there was some ridicule from people on the internet saying that Shea was stat padding. Now... To me, looking at, I actually want to hear your opinion. You saw the play. Mm-hmm. What are your your thoughts on it? What are your thoughts on the the idea of stat padding? And also, based off the play, did he like? Did he have to do that? Uh, did he have to do it? Probably not. I mean, they were down ten with four fifteen seconds to the left, and he found Andrew Nemhard, and um, you know his fellow Canadian went to the foul line, knocked down both to make it a twelve point game. Then he raced up the floor for a layup. It's a complete non issue for me. Yeah. Um, I think stat padding at First off, it doesn't really hurt anything. I think at the most, it actually is quite funny to watch. Like, mm-hmm. this, to me, is not even that funny. It's just, like, whatever. I mean, there's a lots of plays in the game where it's out of reach and guys foul and they try to extend the game. You know, who knows? Maybe even his coach was saying to do that. But, and, but I think the funniest thing is, like, when you get those, like, Ricky Davis trying to chase his own triple doubles, that's when he's like, okay. Or, like, JaVale had a couple of those back in the day. Where he like threw it off the glass to himself and tried to get some more rebounds. Andre Blatch had one like that. So Giannis did it last season, and and the the, the rebound was taken away, mm. um, so he couldn't get the triple double. Yeah, but I mean like, 
Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. No? Yeah. What bothers it's me about... It's nothing to be shamed for, though, for sure. It's yeah, not sure. a shame for to be shamed for. There's no reason to view Shay differently. Because even with the play, like, maybe he did do that, but I thought it was notable that after he made the layup, he continued to play defense. So is it a case of a player just playing right till the very end? Right? The game's over, but that's, yeah. like, kind of the MO of some teams. Anyways, just want to get your, your thoughts on that one. What does bother me about something that we're talking about is when a player refuses to take a shot at the end of a quarter because they want to save their field goal percentage. Mm. That's stuff that does happen. There have been several players that talked about it. That bothers me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that that actually, I totally agree with you. Like, um, if you're just protecting your numbers yeah. in that kind of way, then no, I mean, you should do everything you can to try to win the game. Yeah. Um, but it is, by the way, I mean, are we just glossing over the fact that Shea has now more 30-point games in a single season than Kevin Durant ever did? That's nuts. KD won MVP and led the league in scoring at 32 points per game in 2014. That's amazing, man. He played 81 games that year. And you're telling me that Shea has more 30-point games than him in that year? That's And still more games to go. <laughs> a lot more games to go. Yeah, he's already at 49. Yeah. He's had 44, 30 to, like 30-point 30 games, and he's had five 40-point yeah. games. Do you so. believe in them in the playoffs? Do you believe they can win a few rounds? I believe OKC is living a charmed existence right now. Ah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. If and when they actually hit adversity, it's going to turn from everything is gravy to we got to focus on what are our weak areas. And when you re it off at that point, that's when you start to truly win. Do you think it's at the center position? Is that the weakness that they're going to get exposed Just, through some of the, the bigs in uh, I think in the size in general is probably going to be their, their yeah. weakness. Also, I don't. I just don't think that Josh Giddy is going to be a positive contributor for them. Yeah, he's not going to be uh, playing the second half. We're not starting second half, so I don't think. We've already seen that a few times. Isaiah Joe checks in instead in some of the games that they're trying to win, that they want to win, and against some of the the heavyweights in the West and East, and uh, that's how it's kind of. But I'm, I, look, I'm very curious to see how they do with yeah. this iteration of the group in making their first like full playoff run as a group together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about the the rise in scoring. Everyone has. And, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, like, correct me if I'm wrong, is it not as simple as if they just change the three-second defensive rule, right? So how many seconds you can be in the paint? How many How many seconds? Like, they changed the rule in the, in the back in the day because teams were taking advantage of it. But now with how open uh, the court is, with how many players that can shoot the three, you got centers, you got power forwards, everyone, right? That's why we're 11-5 out. Is, it, is that not, is that not the, the, the remedy for what they're dealing with right now, is just letting players be in the paint a little bit longer? And not even just, like, a big, like your Rudigo Bears, but also just, like, having more players with one foot in the paint for two, three seconds longer. So what do you want to change it to? Four or five seconds? I think the... Um... I think that's fine. I actually think that that will certainly help the defense. Um, yeah. It probably will lead to even more jump shooting. And if the, I know for a lot of people's concerns, it's mm -hmm. like they feel like a lot of games are just shooting a lot of threes and they're not comfortable with that. And yeah. by the way, that is the main change in league scoring. It's like, and I had the numbers up for Garrett when we interviewed him yesterday. And when Garrett first came into the league in 2009, the league average for scoring is 100 points and they took about 18 wow. threes per game. On average, team. Yeah. Now, well, he's still in the league, but it's 2024. League average for scoring is 115 points per game, and team shoot an average of 35 threes a game. I think if you add even more defensive three seconds, or even like make a defensive five seconds, or you take defensive three seconds out the game entirely and play FIBA rules. Yeah. What you're probably going to see is even more jump shooting. Hmm. So I just again, it's just a matter of preference, but yeah, um, I, I'm in favor of other rules that will change the that will help the yeah. defense. But I, I I'm not hard against like defensive five seconds. Tom uh, Harbistra, he uh, did an article yesterday, and he published essentially that whist that the whistle just isn't going off as much mm. through referees. So they're they're calling less shooting fouls, less non shooting fouls, less technicals, less defensive three seconds, less mm. travels. Everything's mm. down. And that might be the way in which we're kind of seeing the trend go a little bit uh, the other way, where we're we're getting more defensive matchups. I'm thinking about that Knicks 76ers game that was like 80, 85 or something like that. Uh, it was in the 70s. Holy smokes. It was 70, 79 to 73, I believe, was the final score of that game. Detroit Pistons, what, 2002, 2003, whatever that team was. Um, we went back to those days. Yeah. Crazy basically, time. Basically, yeah. That was fun. I want to see more of that kind of stuff. Uh, so... Another one I want to ask you about. Oh, and do you really? You really like seeing 70-point games? I want to see a change of pace. 
I want to see games where, like, yes, 120, That's a change of sport when you go from 115 <laughs> points per game to 75. That used to be the game that yeah. we loved, right? Some of these, like, remember some of the championships? I feel the like, finals? hold on, hold on, Ahmed. That's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. why the league changed the way to move to some of these rules to favor offense because teams, people were not loving watching Pistons versus Spurs in the finals and I'm, the games were in the 70s. Yes. Yeah. So, so I don't know if it's things that we loved. Like, yeah. it was like... We did love it, and we needed to change. Now but, they overcorrected, and now it's like, okay, we better go cut back a little bit. But I don't think we want to see back to seventies. But scores in a random, random October, November, December yeah. game. If you're seeing the top two defenses go toe to toe, would it not be kind of intriguing seeing them go toe to toe in the capacity that we're talking about, and just be okay. amazing? So what I like, and you know, yeah, um, uh, game seven between the Raptors and the Sixers. Oh, that baby. Year, right? 2019. Yeah. Of course. Every, that's exactly the reaction everyone should have. Holy. Do you remember the final score of that game? Nope, but I know they went like a five-minute stretch where no one scored. It was like 92 to 90. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a really elite defense in the Sixers going up against a really elite defense in the Raptors. Now, of course, at that time, it's also the playoffs and it's literally game seven. So mm-hmm. it's going to be more intensity in your average game that's being played on, you know, February 15th. Beware of the odds of March. But like... Or a playing game. The NBA hopes. Sure. But... <laughs> Nevertheless, that's what it should look like when yeah. two defensive teams yeah. play each other. So I'm cool with that. But seven, I don't know, 70s, it just becomes a brick fest at that point. Yeah, yeah. There are a few yeah. more questions here, but I want to get to these trivia ones. Um, okay, cool. So trivia question number one, right? There have been a lot of 40-point games in the NBA, right? Okay. Can you name the 10 players that have recorded 40-plus points five or more times? This season? This season, yes, this season. Uh, just, I mean, Shea. Shea, yep, he has... Uh, I have it here. He has five. Yep. Embiid. Yep. He has nine. Which is amazing because he's <laughs> not played for a month now. Yep. Um, you said how many players? Five? How many players have There's done this? There's 10 players. There's 10 players who have done this. Five oh. or more 40 point games. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. That's a long list. Okay. Giannis. Um, yep. yep. Who else is leading the league in scoring? Has Jokic done this? Probably not, nope. honestly. Yeah. He's not, he's not that high. Luca. Luca, yes. He has the most yeah. at 12. Um, I don't know. Brunson? Has Brunson done it? Yeah. Five. Yeah. So what am I at now? You have five more. Five more players. To help out? Yeah, go Think ahead. guards. Think point guards. Think point guards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Fox? Has Fox done this? Yeah. Seven. Fox has seven of these. Seven. Yeah, you know, he, he didn't make the all-star kick. I know. <laughs> it's tough. Uh, has Dame done it? Dame, no. Not, not he's yet. not in this category. No, he's not. Okay. hasn't done it five times or more. Hit me the rest of the list because I also want to talk about Raptors magic. Okay, yeah. Steph Curry, Devin yes. Booker, okay, yeah. Kevin, Durant, Kevin Durant, Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. Um, Steph Curry has six. The other guys all have five. Yeah. Yep. It's a lot of 40-point games. Yeah. I was going to ask. By a lot of players. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir. I was going to ask you if you could name every person who's received a flopping fine, but I don't think we have time for oh. that. Just to see which guy. I know Gary Trent Jr. got one. And yeah. I know Kelly Olenek, by the way, got one. Yes. Retroactively against the Nuggets. In yeah, which case, I'm like, yeah, he flopped against Jokic. What do you want Kelly Olenek to do against Jokic? Again. Or NBA? Like, please. That, that. You got you got to versus embellishment. <laughs> the new epidemic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, listen, yep. tonight's game. Yep. Uh time now for between the lines brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Line tonight, Magic favored by eight and a half. Uh over under set at two seventeen. So again, you're seeing less scoring, but it, also the Magic are just not that's uh potent of a scoring team. Gary Trent's questionable. Obviously, no RJ, no Chris Boucher, uh, you know, no Scotty, no, no Yaku. But it seems like the Magic are pretty healthy. Amit. Yeah. I think the Raptors have really struggled with size, so I think I'm going to go with the Magic. But what are you going with? Um, it's going to be the Magic. It's definitely going to be the Magic. However, <laughs> if the Raptors okay. if the Raptors do win this game, something to look at is uh-huh. Jalen Suggs versus Emmanuel Quickly. That matchup is going to be the key to the Raptors being right. able to score the ball and how they're able to get Jalen Suggs off of Quickly. Mm. That's going to be the key for them. But for the, sure. the Magic, uh, they're a good team. They're a very good team. I think for Quickly in particular, we've seen him go up against certain physical point guards that have really, really cur- curtailed some of his effectiveness. Yeah. So. It's a really good test for him. Hopefully the Raptors put up a fight, but uh, we've seen some lopsided games recently. So that was Between the Lines brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance on the Orlando Magic. That's what we're saying. But anyway, we're going to take a break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network brought to you by Campbell's new Chucky Spicy Soup. When we come back, Jose Calderon, Numero Ocho, back in Toronto. Welcome back to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wayne Lou. Joining us, as promised before the break, a 
former fan favorite, um, probably a forever fan favorite, Jose Calderon, former Raptors point guard, second all-time in Raptors assists. If you're a, you don't have to be a longtime Raptor fan. Everyone knows who Jose is. Numero Ocho. What's going on, Jose? Hey, how are you guys? We are, we are doing really well. We're doing really well. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We wanted to talk about um, your time with the Raptors, kind of go back a little bit and just go through your career. We wanted to talk, obviously, with you about Spanish basketball as well. Um, and then just a couple of assorted questions um, that have really come up recently. But, um, yeah, if, you, if you're good with that, I would like to start with your time in Toronto. And, and of course, you came here uh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, but do you remember how big of a culture shock was it when you first came to the NBA? It was a little bit. It was a little bit. Uh, the biggest uh, issue for me was more than anything was the, my language. I think it was uh, I was playing a few times. Uh, I talk about the story about, you know, calling plays and people don't understand. And so it was a little bit hard. <laughs> you know, we, we have to switch from uh, voice calls to just signs because people felt more comfortable with, uh, with the signs. Uh-huh. So it was a struggle. It was a struggle. That first year was tough. Uh, we got a great, uh, you know, great teammates. It's true that they helped me a lot. But being a point guard uh, coming from Europe and uh, not really speaking a lot of English, that was um, probably the, more, the biggest shock of all. Uh, even like, you know, uh, I think Toronto is a, it, probably the more American city, but still more European than anything else. So for me, that helps. And it was a great adjustment right away. Yeah. Um, did you have any funny moments uh, in terms of like a, a language barrier or I know you spoke English, just, just not maybe as strongly as you do now. Um, but did you have any funny moments of misunderstanding with players about uh, just, again, that language gap? There's two things. Once uh, at the beginning when they were laughing in the locker room, I wasn't sure if they were laughing about me or from, the, you know, of me. Or So they laugh, I laugh. So, But I have no idea. So maybe that's why they were like, oh, this guy is cool because they, he's just laughing. But I didn't <laughs> yeah. really know what was going on in the locker room. And after the, the second one was when one, one play that uh, it was called diagonal. Uh-huh. Um, and I couldn't, you know, it was diagonal, di- diagonal, diagonal, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I look back from half core, you know, I'm trying to, to call the play, and my four teammates are looking at each other like, what's the play? Like, what, what are we supposed to be doing now? Yeah. So since that day, you know, Sam Mitchell just changed everything. We went to a fist up, uh, two down, <laughs> horns up, and that's it. That was the end of the of that play until uh, my English got a little bit better. Yeah, things that are a little bit easier uh, signal with, with hands. I get it. Um, so I think uh, for a lot of fans, people are remembering about um, – you know, your point guard partnerships. I feel like every single year when you were with the Raptors, the Raptors also brought other point guards to help run the point with you, but also sometimes to try to compete with you. And I know that, um, you know, obviously you stuck it out for a long time. Again, you're second in Raptors assists. I think that speaks for itself, the longevity. But talk to me about um, uh, playing with TJ Ford and and starting a point guard. Those The two of you guys sort of trading off on that job. Yeah, it was great. I mean, for me, it was always, always good. You know, all these, uh, my teammates, I always had great relationship with all of them because at the end of the day, it was about the team for me. Um, so with TJ, same thing. He came, he was a starting pointer uh, my second year. So for me, it was great. It was a, uh, just uh, keep learning from guys who've been in the league, uh, around the league, and a great player who, you know, who was able to score in a lot of ways. I was completely the opposite, so I think it was a good tandem for, for that team. Um, and that was kind of like the thing. He got injured, so I replaced him for uh, the starting position, and after from that, you know, uh, is when the Raptors in the third year, they decide to to get me as a, as a starting point guard. But, uh, but yeah, but, I mean, for me, it was always that challenge of uh, being, you know, being together, trying to, to play the best I could. And I think usually the, the players that they were coming in uh, to play my position were just a different style of players. So it was perfect. I think you always think, uh, talk about, okay, this is great for the team. He can score more. I can pass better or whatever. So that was for me always the key. And, um, and TJ was that. Uh, I still maintain a relationship with him. Oh, nice. uh, it was a great tandem. We went to the playoff. It was a great season. And, you know, uh, just the bad luck of him getting that injured that, you know, is slowed him down a little bit because for us was a really important piece on, on that team. Yeah, I, I'm personally, I'm still mad at Al Horford. Every time I see him, I, I back of my mind, I'm like, but you heard TJ Ford, and I know it wasn't on purpose, but I, yeah. I still get a little upset about it. I, I remember, um, you know, reading a story, this is, again, so long ago, but I think TJ, you actually went to the coaching staff and you said TJ should start, and you actually yeah. volunteered yeah. to come off the bench. Can you tell me about that story? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we, you know, TJ came back from the injury. The, the team was playing really good, so the, the you know, coaches decided to stay the way that that way and bring in TJ from from the bench. But you know, it was two things. Like he wasn't comfortable on that, you know, with his role. Uh, you know, everybody was kind of like waiting for him to to be back as himself, and that's, I thought it was the best way of like, look, I know I've been playing good. I know the team is playing great, but. But we need TJ. We need more people to be able to get to what we want it to be. And we were fighting to to get the, that Atlantic Division title and everything like that. So uh, for me, it was like I always say, I mean, for me, always the team was first. So yeah. this is not about number or stats. So I thought that was a good thing for, for our team and, and for TJ as well. Just, you know, that's his role. That that's, He was the starting pointer. I was just replacing him. And uh, I was just getting back to uh, our regular, you know, stats, if we could say that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th- I think first off, you know, a-, a lot of players would want to continue to start, especially if the-, the team's successful. But I think that's what you're talking about. You've always put the team first. And, you know, again, the, the team did try a couple different other point guards, especially after TJ got hurt. Jared Jack was brought in. Jared Bayless. I think, you know, some of these other names, but it, it didn't really quite work out. It was usually the coach would always come back to you. Um, and it wasn't until Kyle Lowry came through where it was like, OK, finally, I think the Raptors can maybe pivot in a different direction. And unfortunately, obviously, that led to um, you getting moved off the team. But um, I was actually, we had Dwayne Casey on the show uh, earlier this week. And Dwayne was telling us a story about Kyle, especially the way he was when he was early on in his career, was so, so competitive. And he just, he, in his words, he, Kyle was trying to kick your ass in practice every single day when he was coming off the bench against you. What can you tell us about uh, competing against Kyle, even within the same team? Ah, it was great. I mean, uh, I love Kyle. He's been a great, a great friend since since those days. Uh, I think the good thing I, I brought to the table is like they understood that you could compete against me as many times as you want, like uh, because it's good for the team. Uh, that doesn't mean we cannot be friends and or be even best friends uh, outside of the of those lines. So that was always me. That's the way I am as a person. So the competitive, like, it was great. I mean, I was learning. I was uh, growing. Uh, he was making me a better player. I was trying to make him a better player. He listened. He understood that I, you know, every time I was saying something, it was to help, not to trying to get anything wrong about it. Yeah. So uh, that that was the trust that was there, and you know a lot of things happened. You know at that time I was uh, as well my expiring contract. Uh, I was playing really well at that time. So you know it was Rudy Gay was they were able to get Rudy Gay on that trade. Yeah. So it was more than just you know giving Kyle the, the keys. It was just the situation of everything, and I yeah. think that was a good a good thing for the team, a good thing for everybody. I think Kyle deserved to be where where he you know the starting pointer for that team. I think you know he was a different player when he arrived and when he uh, when, I, when I left and uh, I mean look what happened after that so it was it was great great to see that growth of, of Kyle in Toronto yeah I um I, I think are, are you and Kyle friends like I feel like I, I think I saw something where you wanted a reporter to tell Kyle to to answer your text or something like that this is maybe back in yeah. 2019 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was in the last, I think it was the last All-Star or something. I don't know okay. what it was, no, the finals. I think it was when he played the finals. That was last year, no? No. Yeah, with Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think Miami, it was yeah. in Miami, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, uh, yeah, I'm like, look, I just ask this, and, uh, yeah, we, he has spent some time in, in Spain as well. We're always in contact, uh, oh, like nice. him, I'm in contact with Demar, with a lot of the guys, so. Like I say, it was always a good relationship, even like from the outside, people maybe were thinking something else or trying to, to figure something out for yeah. us was, you know, about the team. I was trying to help them. I am so, you know, happy with them and the career that they have after those years uh, with me. So I love it. It was, it was always great. Uh, speaking of DeMar, what do you remember about a young DeMar when he first came in? Because he came in super young, right? 19, and you were with him for the first, I think, three or four years. What do you remember about the young DeMar DeRozan? Well, I remember that he actually was probably the opposite of what he is right now. You know, like he was a raw talent that couldn't really uh, shoot the ball. Super athletic. He is still being athletic, but he doesn't, doesn't use it that much. But now he came to, uh, yeah, he, he went to the other way. Like, so uh, in the finesse, finesse, uh, playing great. I mean, that ball work, uh, he can not miss a shot every time he shoots from two. And, and he had to go with his own style. You know, he didn't get into the what happened with the three-point line or the new NBA. He keep playing his way. He's up there in the scoring uh, history of the NBA, and he still have a, a few years to go. So yeah. I think it was that same thing. A guy who was able to work, to listen, to, to really get better and uh, wanted to be better and wanted to be the best he could be. I mean, 
an impressive uh, career what, he, what he's having for sure. Yeah, for sure. You could definitely tell how much hard work he put into that, right? Because I remember young Demar, just like um, obviously you, you played with him, but it was like exactly what you mentioned. It was very raw, but to see him now and how skilled he is, the footwork, the the touch that he has on his shot is incredible. But I think also something that takes a lot of hard work is is, is leading the league in free throws. Um, and uh, 2009, you were at 98.1 percent on the season, 151 for 154. I'm sure you get asked about this probably more than almost anybody gets <laughs> asked about free throw shooting. But in that year, and I know you, your longest streak, I believe, was 87 consecutive, which I think is the second longest streak ever in NBA yeah. history. Um, you made 87 for 87 at one point. Was that in the back of your mind? Did you ever like when you ever set to the free throw line for like a technical or you got fouled or whatever? Did you ever get like, is that in the back of your mind? Like, I can't miss this. Not just because I need the points, but like I have like an NBA record going. It was, it was there, but it was because it was getting bigger and bigger of a story. Um, and that was the problem too, uh, in a sense, because players start talking about it. Players were joking around. Hey, I, I yeah. got a hundred dollars that you're going to miss. <laughs> I got a hundred that you will, I got a hundred that will, you will get to, uh, to 100, uh, yeah. before you miss. Uh, so people start talking about it. Some teams too. I remember going into Sacramento, mm -hmm. uh, go to the line and actually the guys from the arena, just telling everybody like, look, this guy got 54 or 55 on a row. Oh. Let's get, let's make him me. So people went crazy about when I was going to the line in some places. So, so that was the whole thing about it. So I remember my three misses. Um, okay. It was an impressive, uh, impressive year that I, you know, never get even close to that uh, because uh, thinking now about it is like it's almost impossible. Like I didn't, yeah. I, I wasn't a huge free throw shooter like a uh, number wise. So it was even more difficult because some nights I went Hollywood one and after maybe three one day or four or whatever and zero for two games. So, yeah. so it was difficult to, uh, to keep it that way. But, you know, it was a scene that it was there. I was trying to focus on the whole thing and just, uh, it was, uh, I remember the last game, mm -hmm. I remember coaches telling me like, don't go to the line tonight. Just, just shoot from the outside. <laughs> it was a, it was a game. It was a game that didn't mean anything to us before. Uh -huh. uh, I think it was, a, I don't know, but, uh, the guy, the, the coach is like, no, you have an amazing, like, don't, and I went actually, it was four for four or something. Oh, wow. nice. but they were like, don't, don't, don't get it. It's the last game of the season. Don't, don't come, don't mess it up now after all these games, just, uh, yeah. making free throws. So I remember some of those stories. For sure. I think I think it's still the NBA record for highest percentage in uh, for free throws in a season. 98.1 is just is is just crazy to look at when you when you go to your uh, when you go to your basketball reference page. Um I wanted to ask about um your time with the Spanish national team as well. I know um one thing, you know, Canada is doing a lot better recently and and actually Canada made the Olympics finally, the men's side finally made the Olympics by beating Spain um in the in the in the World Cup last summer, so I'm sorry about that. But um I know that uh, the coaches, um, both the men's and the women's team, have spoken so much about how much they want to emulate the system that you guys were able to bring in Spain in terms of the connectivity from the youth level to the, the national team and just maintaining that identity throughout um, and being able to sort of put players into these systems that, that they can really thrive and be comfortable in their role. Um, you know, when you hear that, when you hear that kind of respect um, given to the national program that you guys had with Spain, how does that make you guys feel? And, and how special was it to to play under um, just some really glorious generations with uh, Spanish basketball? I mean, it's great, and I think that's that's the I like the 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 pride or being proud of what we did more than anything, you know, more than winning or getting medals or go to the Olympics. I think for for a long time we were able to be competitive and play for every every medal, every trophy, and that was something important. The second thing of it, would you say about the Spanish and the coaches as well that now in Canada, it's about for us going to uh, to uh, play for Spain. It wasn't like. I'm missing my summer. Uh, this is vacation for me. It was actually something that we love and we embrace as something great. Uh, instead of going work out in summer, we, doesn't matter, Miami, LA, or whatever, uh, we were working out with the best. I was working out every summer with Pau Gasol, with Marc Gasol, with Navarro, with uh, Rudy Fernandez, with all those guys. Like It's like, why instead of being by myself, I cannot be here having fun? So we were like a family. We love each other. Uh, our families came to visit and it felt like going with our families we just our family was the one joining the group so that's kind of like chemistry that we have uh, it get us to win a lot of championships that other teams didn't have that chemistry that good feeling with each other and um, we didn't have we never had the feeling of wow this is another summer that you're gonna lose just i cannot be you know on the beach or whatever yeah uh, we actually you know 
love to hang out with each other, and that that was key for sure. I think you know that's the chemistry that you guys saw, you know, on the court as well. I think that that directly translated. You guys had such a great style, and I think it was such a distinct advantage because you know you look at some of the most historic games, and you think back to 2008 in Beijing, right? You guys uh, played the yep. gold medal match against uh, Team USA. First off, what do you remember about playing that match? Because it got really close. It was really intense. Like, do you ever think back on it? Because I, it might be a little bit painful, but I, I think you guys had a real chance to even take gold on that. No, and no, no, no at all. I mean, no painful. I think we lost against an amazing team uh, in 08. I think it was a little bit more painful 2012 because we actually thought we could beat them mm. after we lost the first time. So I think the second silver medal four years later, that was actually most painful than the first one. The first one, we were so happy to be able to get to the final. It was our first time going into that. It was our first uh, Olympic uh, medal. That is impressive. Some, you know, always something that you always dream as a kid to have an Olympic medal. Doesn't matter which color. Of course. Uh, so we were. You know, we were upset because we lost, but we were so happy with, with the whole performance of the team and being able to to uh, cut that. Now, 2012 was a different story, uh, another close game. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at it, it really uh, from perspective, they have an amazing team. It's yeah. impossible to stop all of those guys. Yeah. They saw with you stop, you know, LeBron, and it was D-Wade, or yeah. it was Chris Ball, or it was Kobe Bryant, or it was <laughs> Carmelo Anthony. And like, yeah, you cannot, you know, all of them having a bad day it was tough. And we almost got it. So that was the positive thing about it, that we always talk. Uh, for us, maybe it was the one thing that we missed, having an Olympic gold, Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. We end up with three medals. Yeah. That is amazing, but we always lost against the U.S. Uh, and that's right. the only the only little thing we were able to get the world cup that's no problem uh we got it mm -hmm. but those olympics uh, you know they always those let's say the first teams if you could say that from the, the u.s it's always mm -hmm. always uh tough to beat and uh but they were scared you could see the redeemed team they could say whatever they want to say mm -hmm. but it was closer than when they were saying there oh for sure <laughs> Because I think, sure. when I think back, and, and I remember watching it so closely because I'm Chinese, and it, it was the Olympics in Beijing. It was such a big, big deal, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think back to the USA team, and it looked unbeatable. I think when they played other teams, it was like they were beating them by 30. But, yeah, it, it was it was close in the fourth quarters, and you guys had a lot of yeah. great moments against them. And, you know, it was really Kobe. I think, I don't know about you, but for me, watching the games, it was like Kobe really took over for that group. And, it, yeah. and a team full of stars, it was actually him that, that took over. Was that yeah. your experience as well? Yeah, yeah, as well. But but I could see, you know, looking at the bench, at the other bench, their faces, their reactions. I I knew them. I, I knew them from the NBA. Yeah. I know how they were playing and reacting with other teams. So we felt that they were like, okay, guys, mm. this is real. Uh, this is getting close. And uh, these guys are yeah. probably, you know, better than we were expecting. Or even if we were expecting that be good, they're actually playing good as well. Yeah. So that was the whole experience. Um, but it was great. I mean, right. great challenges. Uh, we try everything. Uh they they came back with yeah that those big threes and all that stuff so mm. that was good I mean the, an amazing experience uh, for us uh, having three Olympic medals is something you know you cannot have like a dream even about it so yeah. even if it wasn't the the most precious one but uh, I think it was good enough. Um, I wanted to ask about two of your teammates on those on those teams. Um, number one with Marcus All. Uh, so obviously you won the championship with the Raptors. Very beloved player here in Toronto. Actually Toronto's had a lot of good Spanish players as well. Shout out to um, Jorge Garbajosa as well. Also, a really yeah. good Raptor until he got injured. Um, but yeah, with with Mark getting going into retirement, to, to, um, you know, what is he going to do next? I, I saw the big Instagram post that he made. So has that been announced? What Mark is going to do next? And and do you still keep in touch with Mark? Yes, we talk a lot, all of us. Uh, Mark actually owns a team in Girona. He's yes. the president there, so he had a lot of like little things and other businesses, but. That's his main job, being the president. He was the president, owner, and um, player at some point. Uh, you yeah. know, the last year that he played, but he did, he year just decided to just stay on the on the front office and not be on the court anymore. So that that's the the kind of the official retirement thing. But we all knew that that last year was his last playing, and uh, that this year it was going to be difficult for us to see him back on the court. So he's doing great, uh, amazing career as well. We talk a lot. We all that generation are really good friends. We're so close that um, that is like you know it's just uh, tough not to uh, to enjoy now the even the you know what everybody's doing after after basketball. Yeah, well, I, I was gonna ask about Ricky Rubio as well. Um, um, you know, he's he's opened up about his struggles recently as well. I just want to know if you've you've checked up on R Ricky. How is he doing? And I understand he's gone back to Europe. Yes, I mean uh, I've been in touch a lot because uh, you know I'm. 
I'm part of the front office in Cleveland, so he was part right, of our of team as well, and, yeah. and a friend. So I was really close with the whole the whole scene. And you know, the, the best part about all of this, like he's really happy. He's back on the court. He's playing with Barcelona. He played a couple of games with the national team in this uh, the FIBA window. So uh, he's back. I mean, he's smiling again. That's what we wanted to see. And uh, me as a friend, you know, like uh, so that's that's the the, the main part. So uh, taking him playing last night, uh, it was great I, as well. I was watching a little bit of a Euroleague game. And, uh, so nice. So it happened to uh, to all of us. Uh, you know, you got to be always uh, taking care of not just your body but your your mind as well. And and I think that's uh, special. And he came out in one moment that maybe not a lot of people were able to do, like right before going to a main event with Spain and, and be the, the main guy. And he decided to look. I need some time and go home. And and he, uh, I think he for sure will help a lot of people in a, in a lot of uh, different sectors of the life because I think this is not just professional sport. It's uh, any any people in any kind of work. Uh, I think it's important to being able to take care of uh, of their mind as well. Yeah, it was very it was very brave for Ricky to 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 put himself out there like that and explain himself. And I know it's not easy. I think in sports, all we really we we focus so much on delivering results and how are you going to be on the court and, and what are you doing to, to win the next game. But I think when you take a step back and you see moments like that, that was a real courageous thing that, that Ricky did. I, I'm curious, especially from your side with the Cavs, like what are some of the ways that Cleveland and, and you guys in the front office and as an organization did to support Ricky in this time? Everything, everything that he asked for, you know, just trying to, to have as many resources that he needed. Uh, just putting on them, you know, hey, whatever you need here, they are all these resources for you. If there is a space, if there is whatever, you know, if I think it was just, you know, uh, okay, Ricky, what, what's next? What you need to uh, to get back to yourself? How we can help? Uh, I think that's the first, the first thing you can do with uh, in a situation like that. There is no anything else. The, the contract is a uh, is secondary. The, whatever it is, is more about the person, relationship, and just trying to do the right thing for him to be back to whatever he needed to be. And, you know, you never know if it was going to be a month, a year, or, or, or three years, or two days. It doesn't matter. It was about him, and, and that's what we were trying to do from the beginning. It's just like, okay, we're here for you, and let us know what, what do we need. We have all these resources for you. Uh, let us know if you need any of them, or if you need some extra ones, we'll be ready for you as well. So. All right. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm happy to see he's still playing too. Because again, going back to 08, just the, the the image of <laughs> Ricky with the very long hair, and he was like 18 years old, just just a boy, and he was competing against like again Team USA and and running the group and going up against like Jason Kidd, who I think at that point might have already been 30. Yeah. Uh, impressive, impressive player for sure. Um, I wanted to uh, ask in actually finally just a couple of other ones. Um, I, I read a story recently that the Cavaliers kept calling you a billionaire. Back when you played on the Cavs, yes. yes, because there's a there's a there's a Mexican uh, billionaire uh, also named Jose Calderon. Now you guys are obviously not related at all. You're Spanish, he's Mexican, uh, but it became something of a running joke. So tell tell us about this. Yeah, it was it was a mistake by uh, I think it was Wikipedia or something. I, oh, I guess okay. uh, everything started with Johnny Fry. Uh, I guess he looked up uh, my name or something, uh -huh. and he saw up that I was worth you know two point or whatever billions. <laughs> So then he started to talk to everyone. So we weren't going for dinner, and he will be like, "Hey, the, you know, the billy, the billionaire is not to pay." <laughs> so, so the whole thing, you know, broke up. Everybody was joking with each other. Yeah. Everybody was talking that even ESPN have a, a note about it just to explain for everybody that they, they know. But some players, same thing that with the free throws, some, some players were like, "Are you really billionaire? Why you why you are playing basketball?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Look, it's not me." Not me. I play <laughs> basketball because it's fun. So it's not like yeah. people were thinking like I was just playing just because and uh -huh. that I didn't need the money. It wasn't money or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was going on for a while until you know uh, we had I had to answer some questions to uh, to uh, one of the all the reporters and say, look, this is how it happened. If Channing Fry was the one to start it. Uh, it was it, it's, it's true like if you look at it, yeah. it says that I was worth that money. But you know uh, I was playing. Look, this is not me. Uh, same name, my family, whatever, but nothing to do with uh, with my family. Even with that, they were always like, "Yeah, yeah, right, whatever." Of yeah. course. <laughs> so, so it's always it was fun. It was a great story to to go with, with the season. Yeah. Well, hey, listen. If you were a billionaire, you may do something like this. You you may own a a ham farm, and I think that this is always a story I always wanted to ask you about. You do you own a, do you still own your ham farm? It was. It wasn't like I explained this one too. Okay. I have a ham business, but it wasn't like I I own 
you know, all, all, all the stuff. Like the thing was, I was with people like uh, uh, business, and we were actually bringing some of the the ham, the pata negra, that has, you know, a different uh -huh. kind of ham that it was it was going to Toronto. I brought olive oil as well and some other things. Oh, you were like importing food. That. Yeah, like so it wasn't just like that. Okay. But I didn't have, but I didn't have like the, you know, the real pigs with me or anything like that. It was just, uh -huh. you know, part of. It was a whole. It was a lot of farmers where we, you know, we yeah. usually use with them and work with them, but we were in the other side of things. Like I didn't own. But uh, that people love that. Yeah. I stick with that. I remember even the Raptors putting it in the in one of the media books. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, let's go, guys. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm not have a farm. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but it was fun, yeah. So you're not a billionaire and you do not feed pigs for the purposes yes. of curing ham later on. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. So the worst was, uh, yeah, fake news, fake news. That's fake news. <laughs> well, okay, I think this one's real. Um, you were in attendance for Kawhi shot in Game Seven. Can you tell us? Um, first off, were you in good attendance, and also what brought you to Toronto for it? And what was your what was your, where were you sitting when when Kawhi hit that shot? Uh, it was uh, I was a front row, oh. uh, actually on that on that basket, and this is what happened. It was probably was a timeout right before that play. So me and my son, because we needed to get back to uh, I think we were in Detroit at that time. So we have a car waiting outside. So uh -huh. we were like, okay, let's go to the tunnel. So on that time, I was actually on the tunnel okay. uh, where the players go, trying to get to my car. You know, like watching from there. What, you didn't see it? People, uh, no, no, we oh. see it, but it was like the craziest. Uh, <laughs> as soon as it was like bounce, 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 I was like, whoa. Okay, and I was to my son, Manuel, run. <laughs> so we went down to the to the parking, like uh, a stab, and uh, we were just following the, the party and everything with the little yeah. screens that they were in the... At, uh -huh. the, at the arena, yeah. so um, so it was yeah, it was amazing. So it was so so much fun, yeah. That that is so much fun. All right, last last question. Um, uh, so uh, Kobe obviously got the his statue unveiled outside of uh, well, well, what used to be Staples, what is now Crypto Arena, and on that the uh, the statue of of Kobe after eighty one, he put the one finger up, and that's the the figurine that they've used. And yeah. there's the box score that's been inscribed onto the statue underneath. And it has, obviously, the players who played in that game. It was against Toronto, of course, and you were one of the players. They actually misspelled your name on that box score. They spelled I, it Jose Calderson with, yeah, <laughs> with an that. S as well. Um, first off, they got it corrected. But, yeah, do you just remember being in that game, first and foremost? Yes. I, for me, I always it's, it, I always took it the, the right way in a sense like I was – witness to history mm -hmm. so always from the beginning yes uh, i was on the other side of things that you know it's always better if you're on the other side but uh, but i love it i always joke yeah. around look i i got him a few times he was one of one out of three so 33 percent on my on with my difference oh so i was trying to you know so it was it was always great i always took it like a really nice yeah. fun way of like this that that was amazing i knew that was gonna be a history for sure mm -hmm. um so it was it was great and i always remember with kobe too when we play each other and all years later because that was my rookie season mm -hmm. so for me it was always like oh, okay look this is what happened and you know i always joking around so it was great and um and with the uh, with the other part that you say about the statue and everything i was there like a month ago or a month and a half ago so i went to take some pictures and i was there just walking around but i didn't want to be the one uh, bring it up or making it viral <laughs> so but i saw it i got the picture i'm like wow these guys what happened is I didn't realize the others, the couple of mistakes that yes. uh, that they were there. So I felt a little bit better that it wasn't just me, that uh -huh. it's at, at least there is another two yeah. uh, little things there. So, but it's okay. I mean, it's something that it was another great story to tell. Uh -huh. um, it was hard. And uh, for sure, I, I, I guess in something as important as it is, for sure, they will try to, to fix it. It's something that will be there for forever uh, to remember someone like Kobe. So everything got to be perfect like he was in that yeah. sense and that game. And um, but I mean that, even like that, like even if they keep it as Calderson, uh -huh. because you know I I'm, I got an American passport now, so that's all right too. So yeah. even with that, even with that, uh, I would take it any 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 day. So yeah. so it was always always good. Yeah, well, I, again, I remember because I was a long, I've been a long time Raptor fan. You guys were up. The Raptors were up. You know, for yeah. for a large part. That's why Kobe had to score so often because they you know they were not playing well, and he was the only guy who could score. But my question always is why did you guys not try double teaming, triple teaming? You know what I mean? At a certain yeah. point, like 
Did you guys yeah, try those everything. things? You tried everything? We tried everything. When they started getting back to uh, to the game and he was uh, keep scoring and scoring at the beginning, we were okay with it in a sense of like you winning. Yeah. Kobe is the only one scoring. Everybody yeah. else is like not having their night. So yeah, let's keep doing this way. The problem was he's scoring too much. <laughs> the game gets tight. Yeah. He, they go in front, but you just try to do everything and it was impossible. He was pulling out from just as soon as he was uh, passing half court even. So, so it was crazy. It was uh, impossible to stop at that point okay. uh, when we wanted to do anything else it was just it doesn't matter like double team whatever there is some images always I remember of some of us playing defense on him yeah. it was a perfect defense uh, yeah. he scored over you uh, or you know fouls everything it was impossible so yeah but the was, game plan was, was to let Kobe yeah. score and at least to start the game the game plan was let him score but we take away everything else and then you guys were up it's just he kept scoring yeah. and then you couldn't get him to stop okay Yes, okay. uh, I mean, not not like the game plan was like that, but I mean, okay. he was scoring and we were and we were up. Okay. So you're like, what okay. are you gonna change? You have to controlling the game. The game is under control. Just keep going mm. <laughs> until it wasn't under control. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. that happens. It happens with with all time players, all time greats. Well, Jose, uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I actually, I understand you're you're coming to Toronto next week, right? Yes, I'll be there for the West Park. Uh, foundation tournament yeah there you go awesome well i hope yeah, you always absolutely. enjoy your time back in toronto and thank you for your time perfect no no problem anytime thank you guys okay all right jose calderon long time raptors point guard um honestly before kyle came around the best one that we had for a very long time and uh didn't even ask him about the assist to turnover ratio too he was always super hyper efficient that's why the advanced stats loved them a lot 50 40 90 club i think one year as well um so yeah i mean uh, obviously, Kyle came afterwards, and Kyle was Kyle, and it's undeniable. But Jose is still clearly a lot of people's favorites. So big thanks to Jose for taking the time. We're going to take our last break today. Uh, I've been your host, Will. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's New Chunky Spicy Soup. When we come back, let's bring in Michael Grange. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Liu. To be joined by producer co-host Amit Mon. Big thanks to Jose Calderon for taking the time. Amazing. Um, taking the time to talk about Kobe scoring 81 on him or losing to the losing to the U.S. in the gold medal matches twice. And uh, Jose, you know, having to fight off all these point guards that the Raptors kept bringing in. You know, it wasn't like, I think back and I'm like, damn, I could have maybe angled the questions a little more positively. But at the same time, he's such a nice man. And it was actually great to hear him just go through all those experiences. And and yeah, Grinch, like, we we're joined by Michael Grinch, of course, on Sportsnet. It was year after year where they kept bringing in opposition for Jose. There was always like, this guy's going to take Jose's job. And at the end of it, Jose always started. Yeah, and uh, I always go back with Jose to, you know, his first year as a Raptor. And he'd been signed by Rob Babcock as a free agent. And kind of, uh, who was it? it wasn't that common to be signing European free agents at the time. Mm. And uh, Sam Mitchell didn't trust him. That was the one coach, really, who didn't have all that much time for Jose uh -huh. uh, initially. And the amazing, I think one of the most amazing stats in NBA history, at least mm -hmm. that I've had my hands on, is I think, if I'm correct, Jose Calderon shot 16% from three, maybe 17% mm. as a rookie. Wow. And went on to have multiple, at least one, and then multiple almost 50, 40, 90 seasons. Yeah. He turned himself into a really good three-point shooter mm -hmm. um and he's also one of the people i always talk about when people talk about nba athleticism mm -hmm. and you know it's obvious who the great athletes are right but yeah. but then you know how good even the so-called average athlete might be and i remember yeah. being at a practice uh at the old you know the old practice court up in the air canada center or rogers center or whatever we call it okay it yeah thank you <laughs> yeah that place um and just, you know, Jose just kind of fooling around and just kind of pops up and cocks it back. And, oh, yeah? And just fully Ooh, just... Jose Calderon? Yeah. No, like, I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm telling you, wow. man. I've seen, I've seen, okay. I've seen uh, JJ Redick do that, too. Like, oh, yeah. Like, there okay. are no average athletes in the NBA. There are no yeah. average athletes in the no. NBA. Have you seen... Wait, hold on. Have you seen Fred Dunk? No one has. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to put that out there. I've seen Marquise Noel Dunk. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. And then obviously Kyle back in the day, really. Kyle, man, Kyle has multiple dunks. Also Go look game, up Kyle's right? old catalog. He's, he's yeah, chased down multiple. blocks, man. He's got like four. Career, That's nine, multiple. And the best thing I'm talking, like, <laughs> four think is his, multiple. I think his last one was like, uh, it's like that 16 years ago. Yeah. yeah. No, that was 2015 uh, All-Star game in, in Brooklyn. That wasn't a dunk. <laughs> <laughs> it was a putback, wasn't it? Yeah. They, they, uh, they can't all 
Yeah. They can't all dunk like Grinch. No, actually, no, the, the little support we had, the little report that we were going to play for you was um, we had J.D., J.D. Bunkus on uh, Tuesday. And for one reason or another, we got to talking about scouting reports of uh, the people here in the building because he's been working for a long time. So he's, he's like, Brad Fay can shoot from anywhere. You can't leave Brad Fay open anywhere. And then he started talking about you, and he described it as you got the sharpest elbows in the game. Yep. And they will be used against you. Was was <laughs> was the scouting was the number one line in the scouting report was watch out for the elbows. You know, Grange got that dog in him. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I I, I got to offer you the chance to at least clarify your your own scouting uh, report here. I can shoot it. Mm. And Three point Grange, not, we've not seen just two. We've seen it. And yeah, uh, we have seen it. Yeah, that's yeah, right. I can definitely shoot it. Yeah, I used to be able to shoot it. Um, and occasionally, mm. I. I I've been in confrontations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. I'm not proud of them. Some of them I'm it's, okay it's, with, but it's, others, it's, no. It's like we're having Gary Trent Sr. in the studio again. <laughs> it's not 3 I'm and not D. not at that level. <laughs> You're not looking for Danielle Marshall? No. It's not 3 and D. It's that was three maybe fights. the most insane five minutes of radio I've ever oh. had. I was, mm. anyone who hasn't heard that, go to the internet, find it. I cannot believe it didn't go like crazy viral. <laughs> That, I was in my car and I was like, "What am I listening to? Is this legal?" Yeah. And uh, anyway, me. I guess if you look like Gary Trent Senior, yeah, you don't worry about details like that. This is the thing. I think you know. And I didn't get this feedback, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, "Oh no, my boss is going to tell me like, you know, why did why didn't you rein him in?" And I'm like, "You want to rein him in? <laughs> what do I look like, man? Like uh, I'm not no. a small man, but I'm not no. going up against I don't, I don't this. Think he's, there's a lot of raining in going on. There's not a lot of raining in going life. on. You're right. I, no. It's like when you're live, and and, and Gary's on. It's just like yeah, it's five minutes. There's there's going to be five minutes where it's like going to overwhelm you a little bit. The man wears a tank top for a reason. He's got nothing to hide. Was right? that Show or the or mink? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing in between. Actually, actually, I don't think I've seen either one in between. Um, at Grinch, I actually wanted to to pivot off of that. Actually, talk about the most recent piece that you wrote about. And I know for anybody who's covered basketball in, in, in Toronto in particular um, for, for some time, you would definitely get to know the Barrett family. Um, Rowan, obviously, RJ now with the team. Um, but you wrote about the passing of, of, of RJ's brother, Nathan. And I, first off, I thought it was a really, really um, emotive piece. I think that you really wrote from the perspective of being a parent, how difficult this much time must be uh, for a family and this sort of, I guess this nagging fear in the back of your mind that something terrible like this could happen at any given moment, that life is very fleeting. But um, you also wrote about sort of, you know, just who Nathan was. And I think that um, not a lot of people are going to be able to get this chance to uh, honor and tribute in this way without having to know them. So I'm really happy that you wrote this piece so people can get to know the family a little bit better and also that we have you here to discuss it. So tell us about the piece and, um, yeah, just who Nathan was. Well, uh, thank you. I felt very uh, torn about writing it. Very, 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 very sad to even contemplate having mm -hmm. writing it. And, um, you know, I, I've known Rowan uh, for quite a long time. And the one thing that we always would talk about if we were together for any length of time or talking for any length of time was always kids. He was always interested in my kids. My kids are pretty much the same age as uh, Nathan and uh, RJ. And so we had a lot, compared a lot of notes and his and Rowan and Keisha, obviously, uh, their passion for their boys was palpable. It was uh, obvious. And, um, you know, they were as excited and eager about where Nathan was in his stage of life as, you know, RJ's is right in front of you, right? You know, and you don't have to know. And, and what really struck me um, was, you know, we've, been uh you know you go post game and and after guys are finished in the dressing room and done their media whatever it might be they usually rj would almost always go back to the floor where yeah. there would often be a large gathering of mm -hmm. family friends people from their church mm -hmm. and you know it, like like people talk about coming and playing at home is it a burden is it a you, 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 there's complications i guess but for rj and i think it in the family it was an unfettered pleasure and joy mm -hmm. And they were able to share it, and um, you know Nathan was at school in Florida, and you you know you just kind of reflect as a parent on you know you want your kids to do great, and there's RJ doing a very special thing, and mm -hmm. knowing that Nathan was on his path, and you know he was a very good athlete himself, a good basketball player, he was at Montverde as well, and uh, you know chose to pursue being a pilot, mm -hmm. and um, you know and then as a family and as parents, 
you know, you have these moments where you think, hey, everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and, yeah. You, you know, we can enjoy this moment because they're fleeting and you never quite let go of the possibility that, you know, every time your kid gets in a car, right? And I'm sure your parents would have, would, oh, you know, right. you know, and mm-hmm. will to this day, I'm sure your family, every time Absolutely. they think of you on that scooter, they're like, mm-hmm. oh, man. And, um, and so, you know, I just wanted to kind of, I felt it was worthwhile to kind of communicate mm-hmm. that uh, emotion that I'm sure many, many people in the Canada basketball family, in fact, all, all the people in the Raptors organization, anyone around who's been around the Barretts, and uh, clearly, I think anyone who's a fan of Canada basketball or the Toronto Raptors, mm-hmm. and just a place to kind of reflect a little bit. So, um, you know, your heart and my heart goes out to all of those people. Mm-hmm. That's really well said. I mean, I echo what you're saying. Like, even in the first segment, we were talking about this, and um, Will read the statement, and just thinking about, you know, obviously, as a parent of two, you put yourself in the same shoes, and uh, after I said the words of, like, you, as a parent, you have lost one of your children, like, I I wasn't the same for that entire segment, because I was just thinking about that, and you're, Mm -hmm. it's not something that any parent wants to do. No. Um, I, I hear what you're saying with the, the feeling of every time you see your kid cross the road, you see them a little bit further away than maybe you want them to be um, in the park or whatever. You get kind of hesitant and you start getting a little uh, shell shock of what could be happening. And I, I feel so, so bad for them. And the crazy thing is it never goes away. No, and, uh, it doesn't. So anyway, so, yeah. So I just, uh, it's going to be a really tough uh, road, I'm sure. And but that you know this that family is an extraordinary family. They have an extraordinary support network, and you just really just want to give them all the love and and best wishes you can. And you know it's it's not a thing that you're going to get over easily or quickly. For sure. And um, yeah, again, you can read this piece. It's up on Sportsnet.ca. After so many triumphs, Barrett family now faces the ultimate loss. And I'm sure this is not something. This is the last thing you wanted to write about. But I think it was very important for you to share some of these stories, share the perspective. And, um, yeah, for RJ, too, I mean, you know, he will obviously take his time to process and recover in whatever ways he feels necessary. If it helps for him to play basketball and process that, go ahead. If he doesn't help and he needs some time to th- reflect and focus, be with family, support them in this time, you know, I'm sure the Raptors will, again, offer every single possibility to um, RJ and, and his family. But, um, yeah, very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Um, I know... The last game, Denver, um, that the one that he played in, I, I think you had the, you were there in the tunnel when you saw RJ come off the court, and he he had been questionable for the game, and he missed a couple games because of illness, and um, I think you brought along that quote of him turning to Darko and saying, "I gave you everything I had tonight." Yeah, he played amazing. Yeah, can you just describe that scene? Of that yeah, game, it was, um, you know, the, they were shorthanded, and uh, it was actually Darko kind of saw him in the tunnel, and he's he's like. RJ's kind of walking side to side, and Darko's like laughing at him, almost going like, "You were tired, you know." Big and Darko's so good in those kind of moments; like he really connects. And, uh, and RJ was just like, "I gave you everything I had," mm-hmm. and uh, you know. And then he, and the other thing, he came in when he spoke with us. You know, it, it, you know, it resonates now because we, because of what subsequently happened. He says, "You know, let's keep it positive." You know, and I. Mm-hmm. There was a lot to be positive about that game and, and his performance at the top of the list. Uh, and it just, it's incredible. I mean, you know, Nathan, uh, you know, he, he, my understanding is he fell ill going back uh, roughly a month, maybe a little bit more. I'm not exactly sure. Came home, was had to come out of school, came home, was being cared for here. And uh, he, the first game that RJ missed for personal reasons was February 14th. It had been going on a little bit previous to that. Wow. And the mm-hmm. amount of discipline it takes. You know, it's just a good reminder, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, personal reasons, and there's a reason yeah. to keep them personal. Yeah. Yep. The amount of discipline and fortitude it takes to uh, be a public figure during going through some of these things is uh, not everyone can handle it. For sure. Mars talked about that, too, on his podcast recently of uh, cases where he's dealt with assorted things in his personal life, but he had to go out there and he had to perform. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, comparable to our jobs. We have things that we go through, but we're not public figures in the same way and he's not we're not gonna be ridiculed the same way that he probably would be had he not performed on a given day uh so to him mm-hmm. to damar to rj professionalism discipline and there's a lot of the stuff like these roots come from your parents yeah and they've done a terrific job with yeah. uh with no, their boys yeah it's remarkable i think especially too it's like 
I, I, for me, I even felt a little silly. It was like, what is the point of like evaluating people's performances, especially Arjun's performance, even when we were just reviewing in the first segment? It was yeah. like, it does feel this whole practice feels a little bit silly in these kind of moments. Not to say that like, you know, that's not what um, people watch basketball for, or you know, like, of course, there's this sort of like. You're watching for entertainment. You're watching to follow and, and be a fan. Of course, that's that's all part of it. But there's also these moments where you show up to watch basketball, but you actually see people and they're in, in whatever state that they're they're coming into the door with. And I think that yeah, in those moments, you if you ever feel the the need or the urge, they're like, what about the basketball? Like just just quash that and just be with the person that shows up in that moment. So whenever RJ is available to come back to play, I'm sure there will be a huge show of support. By the fans, uh, by the organization as well, but um, certainly, yeah. Um, is there is there any what, what do you what, what are you expecting to see tonight, Grange? Who's going to uh, be in the lineup tonight? Because <laughs> I think that that's also been a revolving question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I kind of been focused, kind of immersed in this the last uh, sort of twenty four hours. But um, I think you know it's interesting with Orlando, and this is going to be a pivot. That mm -hmm. doesn't make a ton of sense, but yeah, um, right. the. Um, you know, I kind of go back to, I was in Orlando last year when they played that baseball series in November. Yeah. And um, and I, it, you look at where those two franchises were at that moment, and it's just the, the difference. Seriously? It was, to me, it's, it was almost like a sliding doors event where, you know, the Raptors went down. You know, they were around 500, but, you know, they were intact. They still had all the, were the Raptors kind of moxie. And, uh, you know, obviously the personnel... And Orlando, I think, was 6-20 and 20 at the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and they go in there and the Raptors just got smacked. And I I can kind of pat myself on the back a little bit because the press seats in Orlando are really good. Like, mm. you're quite close to the court. Right. And it's one of those things where you, you're watching you go, no, no, th these guys are w really good. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know if they're better right that minute, but I'm, like, looking at who they were and what. And I was Scotty was struggling at that time and Wagner was really starting to take off and, uh, Markel Fultz was oh, I hear you, though. a great yeah, year. I remember that game. And uh, he had just come back from injury, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the they look strong, big, tough, fast. They're deep, and too. Deep. Very and deep. And they're like, this team is not a 6 and 20 team. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and kudos to them, you know, and they're, they're actually, you know, they're a team to watch in this offseason, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying this because I've got any particular knowledge, but. Mm -hmm. If you were the Orlando Magic, wouldn't Emmanuel quickly be a pretty interesting a point guard that can really shoot? That's always been the thing, right? Mm -hmm. He's a restricted free agent, and I mean, I think there's a couple of teams out there like that. San Antonio, also, mm -hmm. you could make that case. Um, Luckily, he's restricted, and yeah, no, but you know, but I don't think the notion that the Raptors are going to get Emmanuel quickly at any kind of discount, mm -hmm. I yeah. think, is you know, your wishful thinking. Yeah, because right. I think if they're if they're not aggressive, I think there's some teams out there that. I mean, I couldn't think of a better fit than the Orlando Magic. They got a lot of guards already, too. Yeah, but, I they, know, but, but one, but one well, who can play on ball, off the yeah, ball, yeah. and shoot it, yeah, yeah. he can. They just got a new coach, too. Jamal Mosley got a new deal. Yeah, well-deserved, honestly. He's got a young team that really play defense, which is why I think, like, you know, remains to be seen with Dark Horse. Like, he's got a really young team to play really good offense. Next season and beyond, and he needs to bring that defensive element as well. But um, we'll I mean, can talk about that at a different time. Yeah. But, uh, Grange, we appreciate you. We will... Well, I was gonna say I'll see you down in the arena, but um, that's also TBD. So <laughs> I'm not gonna be there tonight, Grange. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we admitting this on air? Raptors PR. We did not say that. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, appreciate you, Grange. Everyone, yeah. go read his piece. And uh, yeah, I really thank you for taking the time to you know process through this uh, nice with us. Me on. For sure, Thanks, always, always. Um, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's New Chunky Spice Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find The Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please re-interview the program. Big thanks to producer Amit Vaughn, our producer Derek Brandale, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jeremy Manitad for helping behind the scenes. Big thanks to our guests today, Jose Calderon and Michael Grange. And we'll be back to talk to you next week.